as you all know, we are excited about the book behind us, The Promised Land, and also for members today to be a part of this discussion, an important discussion about an important book. So without further ado, uh, we'll bring on our special guest today. Hey, everybody. Yay! Hello. So they, they had scheduled somebody else, but they couldn't make it, so I had to fill in. Wow. It's nice to see you guys. Excellent. Nice to see you. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. So, excellent. You know, I I I wanted to come on here because uh, I was talking to Ramonda and Derek before they uh, before y'all came on, and I guess Mahogany wasn't open in D.C. Uh, when I was still in office. They they opened right around when I left, and so I I hadn't uh, heard about it because frankly it's hard for me sometimes to go to bookstores. <laughs> And uh, when we heard about all the great work they were doing, uh, I thought, well, let, let's see if we can find a way to support uh, our outstanding African-American <laughs> independent bookstores. And uh, this yes. was our, yes. you know, this yep. was, this, this was our, our, our maiden uh, book club that we're, that we're uh, talking to. And uh, I, I also just wanted to see who the brothers were who named themselves the Very Smart Brothers <laughs> Book Club? It works. So, it works. So, so I'm now I'm going to be testing them to see just how smart they are. <laughs> they certainly are not lacking in confidence. True indeed. True indeed. At least they didn't say the very did. good looking and smart brothers. Book club. That's fired. <laughs> We try our best, we try our best. So we're excited, guys. Wow. So let's go ahead and jump into this. We're going to get to uh, the first question. Um, actually, uh, my question, since I'm going to take some liberties here. Um, you own the store. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so early in the book, um, you talked about your goal uh, for writing this book was to be about a year, right? Um, however, we know it didn't take a year. So um, in that time, I'm, I'm curious, how did the events that was occurring at the same time impact the scope and evolution of the book? Um, but then also, how many times did the editor roll their eyes at you? <laughs> <laughs> well, other presidential memoirs, with the, ex with the exception, I think, of Bush, generally, they're late because presidents, you know, uh, let's face it. But first of all, once you leave, you got to kind of catch your breath. And then you got to gear up and it's going to take a little bit of time. And, and as some of you know, uh, you know, I, I, I write these books without a collaborator. So uh, it, it ends up taking a little more time. Um, but in, in terms of your first question, Derek, about uh, how did events as I was writing impact me? I, I tried to not uh, project ahead too much because what I wanted to do was to give people a sense of what the journey was like for me and Michelle and uh, how things that may seem obvious in retrospect didn't seem obvious at the time, right? You know, I, I hope that we're successful. Somebody could pick up and read this and they could get a sense of what it's like for, you know, uh, a family that, you know, has been blessed and, and you know, uh, has been active in the community, but, you know, has been living a more or less normal life, what it would be like as it becomes less and less normal. And, you know, I wanted the reader to be able to kind of get a sense of, uh, you know, what it might be like the first time you're speaking before uh, a televised audience uh, of millions of people, or the first time that you know, you have uh, 20,000 people or 50,000 people show up at your event or the first time Secret Service comes around or, uh, you know, uh, the first time you walk into the Oval Office. So, so in that sense, I didn't want to, to foreshadow too much what I now knew. Um, but as it turned out, obviously, what, 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 I, what I was even without trying, 
one thing that I did know is, is that some of the things that had happened to us during our journey uh, were signals of what was going to happen later. You know, so when I start writing about Sarah Palin mm -hmm. and that part of the campaign and, and her calling us terrorists and, you know, when we talk, when I write about, um, you know, Fox News talking about, you know, Michelle being uh, Barack's uh, baby mama mm -hmm. uh, or, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. you know, when, 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 when we, when I write about that, I'm signaling, you know, all the all the kinds of undercurrents mm -hmm. that are starting to come up that, you know, you could see playing out uh, during the Trump administration and and uh, uh, and and beyond. So, I didn't. Now, I, I at the time I was writing, I didn't think uh, <laughs> you were going to have a riot at the Capitol. <laughs> I, I, I have to say, I have to say that right. one took me by surprise. Who did? Right. Yeah. Everybody. Right. Blue, right. <laughs> Let's go ahead. I want to um, uh, throw uh, my next question to Panama. Um, have him go ahead and uh, ask a question. Um, thank you for being here. I'm one of the very smart brothers. I like to think of myself as a very good looking brother too, but luckily I'm married, so I don't have to fight that battle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I have a, a, a pretty broad question, you know, in terms of what I was reading in the book, and it's largely about just you as a person and what I gleaned from what I read as well. So in order to be president, it seems like you have to have a tremendous sense of optimism, um, unwavering even just to, you know, this is a, a huge country full of lots of people. Um, and it seems like you managed to maintain a tremendous sense of optimism, even through all the crises and everything that happened. A lot happened during your presidency, brother. So how did you maintain that belief in like our nation's like highest ideals and goals and not fall into the cynicism that a lot of us tend to have as we watch the news, as we deal with neighbors, or in some of our cases with family members that make it hard to believe in all those ideals and goals? Yeah, no, it, it's a great question. Um... Part of it, I guess, has to do with uh, the fact that I tend to to take the long view on things and not the short term. And, and that's something I, I had to kind of learn to do. But I write about this in the book. Um, the, the trick is to be able to, to have that kind of long term perspective, but still feel the urgency of now, as Dr. King wrote about, uh, still feel as if, yes, we made some progress, but man, what's going on now is crazy, and we have to do something about it. Uh, and and or or what happens, you know, when you see a George Floyd or an Eric Garner? That's terrible. That should make you angry. You can't just kind of say, "Well, it'll take time." You have to feel pressed now and angry yes. now or sad now, right? Trying to keep those two things in mind at the same time, I think is, is the, the, the biggest trick uh, to, to sure. not just being president, but just being a, a functioning black person. person in America. Yes. Right. All right. Uh -huh. We can relate fully. All yes. Of us. Right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. We have some great points though, too, having to juggle all of those different aspects. And I want, I believe Bernard had a great question too. When we think about, you know, just as you were mentioning, dealing kind of with both these ideas being seeing the Declaration of Independence and having it be this amazing document and then let's see in America maybe not live up to some of those aspects of it. So Bernard, if you can, I want you to share your question too. I think it'll, it makes me think of what we're talking about now. Okay, uh, thank you, Ramonda. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, can everybody hear me? I can hear you. Oh, good, that's great. Uh, so Mr. President, I had a question where uh, are you aware of like, any instances where any actions or initiatives have been, uh, they were taken you know, without your knowledge or consent? And uh, I guess if so, how did you address it? You mean while I was president? While you were president. Well, you know, I've, I, I've read about a, a conversation I've got with uh, uh, Robert Gates, uh, the defense secretary when I came mm -hmm. into office. Uh, and, and he had been, you know, he had served under seven presidents. He was part of the Washington 
national security establishment for a long time, had been CIA director, had been, you know, uh, I had asked him to stay on uh, Bush. He had been Bush's defense secretary at the last two years. And uh, I needed some continuity at the time because we were trying to fix the economy. So we have a meeting. At the end of it, I say, uh, you got any advice for me? He, he said, uh, Mr. President, uh, I've been around a long time, served seven presidents. Uh, the one thing I know is that every given moment on every given day, somebody somewhere in the federal government is screwing up. <laughs> and I don't yeah. think he used the word screwing up, but you know, I, I kind of clean yeah. that up. Um, <laughs> and look, uh, I, I think you've got 2 million employees in the federal government outside of the military. So that's another 2 million. Um, you got a budget of one and a half trillion dollars annually. It, it's the largest organization, most powerful organization on earth. So I guarantee you somebody was doing stuff I didn't know about every single day. A lot of them. Yes. And, you know, uh, but, you know, so part of, part of my job was to try to build systems right. so that at least you minimize the, the, the screw ups. And more importantly, because you're not going to eliminate them, that you find out about them fast enough to fix them. Yes. Um, the one area where I think you, you'd see stuff kind of get out of hand was when it came to counterterrorism. Uh, the whole machinery that had been built up and drone strikes and all that, that, that stuff gets a momentum of, of its own. So it's not so much that they're not, they're not doing what I told them to do, it's that they are the, the, the whole notion of we're going after terrorists and we'll do whatever it takes. I had to press the brakes at times and say, hold up. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, have we thought through collateral damage? Have we thought through, is this all right in terms of civil liberties? Mm -hmm. there, there were times where you'd have to just check them and, and slow things down because things, once they get moving in the federal government, it's just a big, I call it a big ocean liner. It just goes and, and you have to steer pretty hard just to get it to move in a slightly different direction. Mm -hmm. So that's um, well, thank you. a very, that's a very uh, interesting book. What it makes me think of is, regardless if you disagree or not, there's, when you have integrity, there's certain principles that we can all come to um, an agreement on. Um, and it makes me think of, you know, again, a title of the book, Promised Land, and what um, Christine's question is. So, Christine, if you could go ahead and ask your question to the president, I, I would uh, love to, to hear what he has to say. Sure, sure. First, I just feel the need to defend Capricorns, Michelle Obama. <laughs> <laughs> is that what's going on? <laughs> Man, I, I should I should have consulted my my calendar. I, nobody warned me about that. So um, the question uh, that I have is, I'm I'm often asked uh, just so many heartbreaking and challenging questions um, when I work with work with young people. Um, and I just want to know what are some ways that we can encourage children and help them understand that we are indeed in route to the promised land. And not only that, that they are going to help us get there. Well, I, I think, see, it's, I think it's that second point that, that's most interesting. But uh, was it Christine? Did, did I get that right? Yes. I, the, the, uh, are, do you teach or is it just when you're interacting with young people who are in your family, community, et cetera? Um, I, I call myself a teacher. I'm an author of children's literature. Oh, fantastic. So the, I work with uh, people a lot. Uh, well, you know, you, you probably know better than I do what, uh, <laughs> what, what works uh, with kids and what doesn't. I, I think the thing that doesn't work is uh, pretending mm -hmm. that 
uh, there aren't problems in the world. Uh, you know, kids are, are a lot more sophisticated than you know, mm -hmm. we let on. Yeah. And, and so I think that, uh, you know, if, whether the kid is, is, you know, black or white or Latino or Asian, you know, if you tell them, you know, uh, there's a colorblind society, you know, and, uh, you know, just ignore the handful of people who are bigoted mm -hmm. and, you know, that's probably not, they're not going to buy that yeah. at, at least, you know, right around they stop believing in Santa Claus, they'll stop believing in that. Um, uh, so, so I think there has to be a, a, a fundamental honesty. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, w when I think of optimism, it's not being blind to challenges, it's being confident we can solve them, right? And, and so, I, you know, what I, this is the reason why I, I do steer away from the kind of talk that sometimes I hear young people say, and some older people say, that indicates, well, not much, ha nothing's really changed mm -hmm. in America. You know, and I know that sometimes what they mean is, is that you know, there was systemic racism at the founding and there's still systemic racism. That's true. Yeah. But there is a difference between Jim Crow and somebody saying something politically incorrect. There's a difference between being, uh, you know, uh, disrespected at a store and being lynched. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and you know, <laughs> so, so, I think trying to maintain that perspective and, and explaining to young people that those changes did not happen just because suddenly mm -hmm. the larger society got a conscience. Right. They happened because of Harriet Tubman. <laughs> they happened because of Frederick Douglass. And they happened because of Ella Baker. And... Diane Nash and yeah. John Lewis and and right and by the way, all those people were mostly in their twenties when they were doing all this right. stuff. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. right, right, yes, <laughs> right. And, and and so giving them this sense of what what a glorious thing it is to be uh, enlisted in this long-standing battle for justice yeah. and truth mm -hmm. and 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 that that's how you can make your way in in whatever you know fashion whether it's you're a doctor and you're serving in our community or you're opening up a bookstore and you know creating economic value and spreading you know wisdom or you're a writer you know, whatever it is that you're doing you have the capacity to to be involved in that that is the, the empowering message that I think makes kids um, feel like they can face anything. The message that, that doesn't work to me is the one that says, it doesn't matter what you do, nothing will change. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. because, because if they hear that, yeah, then, well, what's the point? Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and that's, uh, you know, with, uh, with our own daughters, that's what, you know, the message Michelle and I always had for Malia and Sasha is, um, you know, you can't control what, what cards you're dealt, but how you play them, that's, yeah. that's all yes. on you. Yes. Um, but, so. how do we, but how do we shift that? Because you're right. How do we shift that, them thinking, you know, my, my thoughts and ideals don't matter when we see so much happening around us that don't, that don't reflect that. You mentioned George Floyd earlier. You're right. What do we say? How do we combat that? Well, look, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, we find examples of where change does happen. I mean, look at look what look at what Stacey Abrams did down in Georgia. Yes. Mm -hmm. but, but you know what? 
I mean, I think the most important message for folks about Stacey is she lost her election. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it wouldn't be as impressive if she had been the governor of Georgia. Right. But here she is. She lost in part because of voter suppression tactics of the existing Georgia mm -hmm. governor. Yes. And yet she's all like, well, OK. I'm I'm going to keep on going. Right. And take you out anyway. And when? And I, and I would when? not put my money against Stacey in this next gubernatorial election. <laughs> yes. Right. So, so for her. But, yes. but 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 I think I guess part of my point is, and 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 look, we all feel this, we all experience this. Um, and it goes back to I think what I was saying to Panama about balancing optimism and realism. Um I, I do think communicating to our kids uh, the positive examples of people being empowered and making a difference mm -hmm. alongside the tragedy and the outrage, I, I, they've got to see both, yeah. right? The, and, and I think that there are times where um, you know, we are so in uh, invested be, because so often the outrages have been ignored. We're so invested in highlighting those that we forget to lift up the occasional victories. Well, I'm all set now. I mean, all I have to do is say, you know, Barack Obama <laughs> told me. <laughs> you tell him. You tell him. You tell them they can do anything. Why not? You <laughs> have a great point. You know, when I think of Derek and I running our bookstore, our daughter Mahogany, we're juggling a lot. And you were juggling a lot. You mentioned the Affordable mm -hmm. Care Act. You mentioned um, uh, wages for, for Black people. Just a lot of different things that you were juggling um, during your presidency. And I want Rosalind to ask her question because I think it really lends itself to that as well. Thanks, sir. Let me just say first greetings to our forever POTUS, at least mine, because <laughs> after this last administration, woo. <laughs> but <laughs> in the book, you reference in meticulous detail all of the many fires that you had to put out as president, from attending numerous meetings regarding the BP oil spill to determining whether to deploy American troops overseas as commander in chief, to balancing being a father and a husband. And in your book, you also, I think you credit Michelle as the one who stated it was analogous to being the circus entertainer, just spinning plates at the end of a stick <laughs> all at one time. Yeah, I'm, I'm like the halftime show at the NBA game. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, as a recent law school graduate studying for the bar and as an oh, army Lord. reservist, and as a mother of a teenager attending virtual school during a global pandemic, <laughs> what prepared you, if anything, to handle the multiple crises that arose during your presidency? And how do you groom the next generation to mentally prepare for public service who may find themselves in that type of circus balancing act? I, I, I don't think there's any magic to it. Um, you, you know, a, a, a mom, a reservist, a, you know, who's gone back to school. You're obviously, you, you've got more tricks than I do uh, in terms mm -hmm. of managing this whole thing. <laughs> I, 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 I will say a, a couple of things, though, uh, that have been useful for me and Michelle. Um, I, I think that uh, we both figured out pretty early that uh, we had to at least spend enough time on ourselves to stay healthy. So that's one piece of advice, I think, particularly for Black folks, I think particularly for women, mm -hmm. I think moms, you know, you give so much and just carving out a little bit of time. You know, I, I write about the fact that, that we were pretty disciplined about, all right, we, we got an hour in the morning, we're gonna work out. We're gonna kind of shut everything else out. Uh, we'll just have silly conversations, we'll watch you know, Sports Center. In my case, or Michelle, she watched, you know, whatever 
the equivalent of at that time uh, to real wives of whatever it was. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, uh, but you know, there was just that sense of uh, you, you have to have a space to 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 get yourself centered, focused, healthy before you take on all this other stuff. And if you if you start losing that, everything else can start unraveling pretty quick. Um, so 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 that's one little piece of advice. I think the other thing is to recognize that, uh, and, and this may be even more important for women to hear because uh, so often, even in households, and, and I'm not saying nothing about you, Derek, uh, but <laughs> even in households where you've got enlightened men, women still tend to bear a larger burden when it comes to child rearing. Um, and so I think realizing that, yeah, you can, you can have it all, but maybe not all at once, right? Mm -hmm. That there are going to be phases in your life where, um, you've got to focus on one thing, which means that the other thing you got to kind of keep it going, but it's not going to be perfect. Um, and you know, so uh, there were moments where Michelle uh, slowed down her career track when the kids were small. There were times where because I had more flexibility, I took on some things that she didn't so that she could then go and, and kind of really ride on a project that she had to focus on. Um, I, I, I think that that sense of you, you can't do everything perfect all at once and, and prioritizing and, and, and that was true as president. Yeah, it, it, you know, there, there were some things where I said, okay, this, I have to completely focus my attention on this. I just got to put this on simmer for a while. And, and, uh, and sometimes I think we're, we're too hard on ourselves thinking we can do everything all at once perfectly. Um, and then the last point I just make is, is uh, understand that, that nothing significant's done on, on, on your own, whether it's being a mom or being a president. You need help and you've got to have a, a community and a network that can help you. Uh, achieve your goals. Um, I think one of my best strengths as president, and even when I was running for president, is I knew how to put together a team of people who I trusted, had integrity, uh, shared values, and wasn't afraid to delegate and say, you know what, go, run with this. And, and if you need a decision from me, you know, uh, I'm, I'm here, uh, but, but I, I have confidence in you being able to, to, to get stuff done. And, and what's true in professional life is true in your personal life as well. Not being afraid to say you know, to your friends, hey, I, you, I, I, I need you to cover me on this. Or uh, saying to your kids, you know, saying to your teenager, uh, here's some things I need you to be responsible for. You know, I, I don't need to be worrying about whether you're waking up in time for school. That's your job. Mm -hmm. you know? Still in training on that part. <laughs> Still working on that. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know what I'm saying though. I mean, it, yeah. it's, yeah. you know, and, and I think a lot of times we, we feel, especially black moms, y'all feel like you got a, and is your teenager a boy or girl? She's a girl. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe, you know, the uh, girls, they, they, they're so smart, you know, <laughs> At this point, I pretty much told her, you can have the whole rest of the house. I just need my office and my bedroom. And I'm That's my point. <laughs> For my own sanity. I have, I have to. <laughs> but, that, but that's that's something Michelle has always been really good at with, 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 with our girls is, and, and she learned it from her mom, you know, who I love. Miss, Miss Marion, that's, you know, she, because she defends me against Michelle all the time. <laughs> um, but, uh, you, you know, 
our, our, our attitude is with our kids, look, we're, you know, we're going to make sure that, you know, we, we keep you out of serious trouble, but, uh, when it comes to you just learning how to handle your business, getting yourself up, cleaning yourself up, doing your work, mm -hmm. uh, you know, our attitude is um, you're going to be an adult soon, and and you better start learning. Yes. Here's why, and having that conversation with them early. Right. Uh, so anyway, hope that, I hope that helps, but. <laughs> Sometimes you're just going to be tired. <laughs> All the time for right now. All the time. No, I hear you. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You'll get there. You'll be all right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you bring up a great point, too, um, in a promised land. And, and even now, to all the juggling that, you know, that we go through, even as Black women, how we may feel unprepared. We, you know, a lot of us feel like we have to put our super cape on and do everything. And so I, I think Valerie has a great question that kind of lends itself to that too. And I would love her to share that about, you know, just us mentally, do we feel prepared? Do we not? So Valerie, can you share your question? Sure, I can. Hello, Mr. President. Hey, Valerie. Um, hey, I really want to ask you about how you felt with um, Michelle coming down at the inauguration with her inauguration drip. But um, yes, I will ask you. <laughs> yes. I blew up Twitter. <laughs> I was just asking, I was just talking to, to Ramonda about this. Uh, I don't know what it is about y'all with Michelle and her belts. <laughs> I, asked, I asked Michelle about it at dinner the other night. I said, listen, baby, you are gorgeous. I. You know, I understand completely why you are a fashion icon, but I said, was your hair different? Because it didn't look that different. I mean, her hair was laid. It was, her yes. hair was laid. Yes. She was like, yeah, I don't, I, you know, she didn't completely understand. She said, I think it was a little longer this time. Y'all yeah. oh, see some stuff I'm, I'm just not tuned to. Anyway, so I, I don't have an answer other than just knowing she looked good and looks better than me. I understand that. What's your question, Valerie? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm so, that was the millennial in me. But yes, real, um, my question is, um, in the early part of your book, you talk about the significance of starting where you are. And oftentimes, starting where you are seems it doesn't seem like the right place. So can you talk more about um, pushing away those feelings of unpreparedness and uncertainty with that, that comes with that starting point? Yeah, you know, now I think that, how old are you now? I'm 28. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you're so young. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. I'm trying to remember 28. I, I, I was still, Valerie, I was still in law school in 28, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I had, I had, uh, cause, cause I had, uh, you know, uh, when I graduated from college, I said, I want to work in the community. So I, I worked for five years before I went back to law school. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I was in my second year of law school, uh, when I was 28 years old. Um, I mean, it seems like I was a baby. I was, I was just starting. I, I, I did not expect to have everything figured out at that point. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, what I've noticed with your generation, Valerie, is, is I think partly because of the internet and social media, mm -hmm. um, partly because e the, the sense of economic pressure, uh, it, th there's just this constant pressure you guys put on yourselves that if y'all don't have it figured out by 30, um that mm -hmm. somehow you know uh you're doomed right. and, and we see that you know we see that with with a lot of our younger staff we see it with you know a lot a lot of our uh, uh you know, our, our own kids uh and and their friends um so so first first point is you're right where you need to be at 28 i mean i, yes. I, I i'm not getting all in your business about what you're doing exactly but 
you, you know, 28, you're, you're still, the world's still opening up. You, you, you still got a bunch of living to do before you even have to lock in on any particular choice of where you need to be. Um, so, so having some patience with yourself, I think is important. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, the one thing I, I tell my daughters, I think something that I possessed and I think Michelle would give me credit for in, not instilling in her, but, but giving her the confidence to believe in was I, ha- I had a clear sense of what I thought was important by the time I was your age. I didn't quite know how I was going to do it, but I did know by that time, and that's part of why I'd gone into community organizing. And I did know I wanted to have a life that was not built about just making money or having possessions, but I wanted to have a life that had to do with making a community better, mm-hmm. a, a, a country better, my people freer and, and having more opportunity, right? I, I knew I wanted to serve in some capacity. And I was pretty passionate about that. And I was willing to make decisions and sacrifices in pursuit of that. And I knew what I didn't want to spend my time doing, right? So when I'm in law school, you know, I, I did well in law school. I had the option of kind of taking the conventional path. And, and people were surprised when I said, no, that's not what I want to do. Sometimes the most important thing you can do at your age is un- know, know what, what isn't, what is, isn't going to give you satisfaction. What, what, what is it that you're not passionate about? And so Michelle, on the other hand, could, partly because she had been kind of a, she's checking boxes, trying to be the good girl, doing the right thing all the time. She'd gone th- straight through, she was in law school. She's in a corporate law firm. She'd bought herself a sob. She's looking cute. You know, she's, you know, uh, she had joined a wine club. You know, I, I mean, she had, she had gone, she was on a bougie track when she, she met me. And she will, she will not deny that. And, but you know what? That wasn't the world she had come from. It's just, that's the world that she had been told she should pursue because that's the mark of success. Yeah. And I think, I think she would acknowledge that I, if I was the one that was all like, well, is this really what you want to do? You want to be like filing a bunch of corporate briefs for some big companies so they can make more money? Is that, which is fine because some people are into that, but is that what you're into? And she'd be, uh, yeah. And, and she'd light up when she was in the community or dealing with kids or what have you. So at some point I said, well, you know, you, you need to, you, you, the, the, the one thing you, you should have confidence in doing, having had these opportunities and gone to Princeton and Harvard and all that, you, you, you've got the chance to just go ahead and uh, make a decision. You'll land on your feet. You'll get a job. And just by talking to you, Valerie, I don't even know what you do. <laughs> but I know just talking to you, you'll, you'll be able to support yourself. You, 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 you will succeed in terms of just having the, what you need to have a family and so forth. So once you've kind of hit that baseline, then I think the question is, what moves you? What, what's important to you? What, what are you passionate about? Because, because if you know what that is, uh, then you'll, you'll find a way, you'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. And it may not be exactly what it is that you want. You know, I, I I didn't go into public service thinking I'm going to be the president of the United States. I went in public service thinking I'm going to find ways constantly to get people healthcare or improve education or, Mm -hmm. you know, 
you know, uh, cr create, you know, uh, a, a better criminal justice system. I, and, and so even if I hadn't ended up being president, I would have been satisfied with the work I was doing along the way. That's, you know? a, um, I, I just keep, well, first of all, thank you so much. This was uh, fantastic. We, Amazing. We have to wrap up. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate you stopping by. I have to say though, did, did we get enough brothers up in here? Because I, I noticed the very so, smart so brothers. That's how the book club goes, though. That's how our book is that, club is goes. that how it rolls? That's how it always happens. Just the name. This is just the name. Very smart the sisters out here, though. Man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, we, that's a gift. Very intelligent sisters. And good work. Right. Yeah. It, it is not new books. Very smart brothers book club. However, you. <laughs> And I are always outnumbered at these conversations. Always. And uh, so we're, we're used to it. But um, again, this is, this is fantastic. And I just got to say, um, the, part, the part that really seems to resonate with me um, from the book is when you talked about, when you <laughs> the line you said, magic beans, baby. <laughs> I'm like, because you think that's what it is, but it's about all the work you do behind it. And I think that's what really kind of uh, sets uh, this book apart is it is about the promised land, but it's about the work that you do behind it and you make it uh, feel mm -hmm. so human. So we just want to thank you so much for stopping by yes. uh, for our book club. And we really appreciate thank you, you uh, Mr. President. Thank you so oh, much. The, 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 this was so much fun, man. I, I, you know, I, I, I wish I could hang out longer, but uh, they, they, they still work in me. You know? <laughs> uh, but uh, but but I, I'm so proud of of, of uh, mahogany, and uh, and and I appreciate uh, uh, what all of you do. We we, we very much feel um, invested in in all of your success, and 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 I'll I'll look forward to stopping by uh, mahogany in person. Uh, sometime in the future. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Thank Love you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye. -bye. Bye. That was our conversation of, of Promised Land. We really appreciate everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs>